this interview, I will be talking to Fiona Mugano and Daniel Tostado from Expat Partners, a multi-site operation. Bear in mind, as I always say, uh, this was recorded on the 14th of April. Things may have changed. The audio and video is slightly patchy at the beginning of the interview. Obviously, the internet is under a lot of pressure. Please bear with us. Hello, welcome to the latest in our series of interviews with Euro members and colleagues across the world. It's always such a pleasure to connect back with people. I haven't seen Fiona for a while. I'd like to introduce you to Fiona Mugano and Daniel Tostado from Expat Partners. Um, really great to see you guys. Thank you so much for taking Thank time. you for having us. Um, first of all, I know you're a multi-site operation. Where are you speaking to me from now? And then talk me through you know, what's happening. Fiona, where are you? So Daniel and I are both based in Paris. Um, we are actually the only two um, team members who are in Paris. Um, the rest of the team, are some of them are in the outskirts. Uh, we have one person who lives in Rouen. And then the rest of our team are all based in Tours. Um, Tours is south of Paris. It's in the lovely Loire Valley area. And then we have a very large part of our team who are based in India, in Bangalore. Uh, one of our team members is actually in Pune right now with his family. And then we interestingly have our office in China, in Shenzhen. Interesting. So you've really, you're really seeing this from, from multiple perspectives. That's fascinating. Mm. So tell me what at the moment, okay, so what's happening in Paris? I, I spoke to Jeremy Bertou in Lyon a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Um, and just talk me through how the restrictions are working now in, in France. Daniel. Sure. Um, so, as you know, France is one of the more advanced confinements in place. Any person that wants to leave their house has to have an attestation on them that gives the time, the date, signed, and on what grounds they're going uh, outside. Um, it has to be within one kilometer of around their house to go to the store or go on a run. Um, and then there's exceptions for those who work, you know, in the medical industry, those who need to go for um, professional reasons outside of that boundary. Uh, but it's very limited. Um, President Macron just spoke last night. He prolonged the confinement, that's how they call it in France, the confinement, for another uh, four weeks until at least May 11th, with the hope that as of May 11th, we'll be able to progressively deconfine uh, the population. Um, so it's very strict and it's definitely having an, an impact, I think, on the, on the psyche of the French people. Um, and it's not you know, necessarily being uniformly uh, respected or uniformly appreciated. You know, in Paris, 44% of people can do home office or they've gone out to their second or third home. Uh, in, in a banlieue neighborhood, just north of Paris, Seine-Saint-Denis, folks are, you know, stacked, you know, in crowded spaces, um, poor neighborhoods, and it's difficult for those people to be able to continue to respect the confinement. So, so it's, it's tricky right now. Uh, social pressures are really, you know, becoming more and more evident as this has gone on. I think at the beginning we were all quite compliant. But so tell me, I've, t I've just got to ask this because I live in the middle of nowhere, and it, if I was limited to one kilometre, I would not have any food. Can you, if you live in the countryside, and obviously France is a very, you know, a rural, huge country, can you go further than one kilometre to get to the store? I'm assuming so. I, okay. I have. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah and you have to go more than a kilometer to get to your local boulangerie or bakery, you're going to ne might necessarily have to disrespect that rule. So it's going to be more flexible in the countryside. Paris is the most dense city in Europe. So uh, here they can quite... Yes, I, that's, that's kind of what I was guessing. So um, talk me through the impact on your teams in other places then, in your Shenzhen and in India. So... Um of our team in China um, because they've been the real example of um, how this has to be dealt with. Um, they've gone through the confinement, they've come out of the confinement, um, business. And I think that that is helping us uh, to look forward in the same manner to say, okay, we're in confinement right now, well, there's no choice for a start. Um, and the best thing is to use that time as appropriate. Um, and at the same time to think, okay, what will be happening in two, three, six months? Hopefully business will be picking up and coming back. But everyone, very intuitive. Um, you've got to use a lot of imagination, a lot of blue ocean strategy. 
certainly for firms like ourselves, where we're not the big firms, um, we're a small firm. So yes, we, we know this is going to be very difficult. It's, I mean, I'd like to say that, um, I almost think that it's going to be the smaller firms that are going to be able to more dynamically navigate the situation. You know, I'm Californian um, by origin, and they just 3,000 workers. So when you're a big ship, it takes a lot of energy to get things started again. Whereas when you're a small ship, you can navigate big waves. And I think it's actually one of, our, one of the ways that we're going to be able to get through this is the fact that we are able to have different teams and immigration market. Thank Daniel you. also, um, Dominique, just to explain um, Daniel's role, Daniel um, manages mainly what we call private clients mm -hmm. um, and clients are always going to exist um, and that that certainly would be a large player in um, the next stage. Yes, that's very interesting, and I, I love your analogy there about big, you know, big ships and big waves. That's it's very. I mean, as an organisation as well, we're we're sort of quite glad that we've stayed small and lean because it's enabled us to to bring our costs right down. And you know, I think that's that's a very important point. So tell me, um, how was the implementation of all of your kind of remote content? I'm sorry, the internet is very choppy. I do apologise if it's going up there. Um, the, how, yeah, how is implementing your virtual, your new virtual environment? Plan? Okay, so um, for a start, uh, I think maybe certain things have been very, aspects have been certainly much easier for us than other firms, because working in countries and actually in four destinations means that we've been doing virtual home offices for a long, long time. Um, by right, um, the majority of our employees always have the right. So everything to do with security, um, how the policies of working from home, um, those added into the contracts, all that side of it has already been dealt with. Um, what we did see in India was that because not everybody was working from home before this is that before it became absolutely mandatory, we actually saw it come. Everybody could have what I call dongles, so internet connection from home. Um, you know, we ensured that that was all working for everybody. Testing happened. Um, we saw that everybody had a policy that was signed uh, before it happened in India. But otherwise, no, it, it's slightly business from usual. Um, the only thing is, is that, of course, like everybody else, we'd much rather be in the office, at least some days in the week, me with the team. But um, we, uh, we do a lot of calls, a lot of calls. Um, I wouldn't say that I can speak. Um, but we all speak. Every single person in the team uh, has what we call a buddy. And everybody checks up on each other. And then, yes, we have coffee shops and... <laughs> things like that. Our main, um, our main thing is to ensure that everybody is safe um, and that if they're not getting depressed or anything terrible like that above work. It's very interesting. I mean, thank you for saying that because it's, I mean, like I said, like we referred to at the beginning of, of the interview, um, the psychological well-being Everybody in a team is is such a complex thing it's going to come from each other it's going to come from your interactions it's going to come from interactions with family how are how positive how are people staying positive right now um i think people stay positive um i'm going to give you an example people stay positive um when they have a challenge and that they can meet the challenge on friday um we had 22 um posted worker filings to be done um, and we only had partial information. Now that's our holiday. So, and they normally do manage this part of the um, process. And the French team said, fine, French team being the team here in France, said, that's fine, we'll all um, learn how to do this, which is already, we'll get this done today. Then we discovered that actually uh, these posted workers were not going to be starting until the 30th of April. So we thought, okay, that's fine. We'll do all of that next week and we'll have our training from our esteemed 
uh, host company in France, which is actually um, a very large French administration, that no, these people were actually going to stop. And so we said, fine. So we put into place that everything was going to have to be done by Tuesday. And actually, the China office got the information during the weekend. It was sent to the office in India. India actually completed 14 filings all alone and the rest was done yesterday morning. Now that's really positive because you can really congratulate people and say you've been an exceptional team, you had this challenge, you got it done, we um, government body that this was done and to a very large Chinese plant that we were able to do that efficiently and smoothly and um, that's positive. I, I That's fascinating. Sorry, that again, it did break up a little bit there, but that's really, uh, you're so right. I mean, the, in this kind of situation, in a way, purpose is everything in terms of positivity. Purpose results, being able to interact with each other and, and, and also, you know, having great leadership that will actually make sure that, you know, you tell the team. So, well, that's really good. It's really good to know. I, I'd, I'd be happy. Uh, I'd, be happy to, I'd be happy to chime in there. Um, with regards to great leadership, I think that Fiona has done an excellent job with the Next Tech Partners. And I, I'm, not, I'm not just saying this because she's right here on the, <laughs> on the call. With Thank us. you. For the bonus <laughs> later. Um, that one of the key leader, uh, qualities of, of good leadership in this crisis has been transparency and, and honesty. And I think that we've seen that from Fiona. Uh, you know, she's been very clear with us from the get go about what kind of animals. Um, you know, a week or two before France basically closed down, we were already, you know, mentally preparing for that to happen because Fiona was keeping us, um, keeping that all in mind. I think it's been a bit of a mixed bag. We've seen the French president be very clear and explicit in his ministry interior, uh, in, uh, interior ministry, how do you say that in English? Ministry of uh, interior. Yeah. Um, be very clear. They've been basically dragging their feet and only announcing things after, you know, things have already been closed for weeks, um, you know, going to the prefecture and then finding out that it's already been closed. They should have told us that. So um, I think in a time of crisis, we've been able to relationship in a point of transparency and what should be, uh, you know, our moment of need. Well, thank you, Danielle. The only thing that I can really say just to add on to that is, is that I do have an exceptional team. Um, and without them, I... <laughs> Um, what's interesting though, just picking up on um, the, the French administration who are all like everybody else doing their best, um, but it's very interesting. So you have um, certain regions where it's not business as usual, but they're certainly trying to do things um, to help businesses who are receiving or foreign nationals who are here who've got expired permits um, who are here perhaps on short-term visas and then you have other regions where it's no that's the end of it he can stay here because they will continue to work and then he has to go back to his home country so it's quite interesting to see the business perspective and how each region is dealing with it, dealing with it in a different manner i must admit i didn't know that there was quite so much autonomous government in that sense that you know this is not necessarily a national approach um no because the prefet has a decision as well um there's there's of course the state um and but then the prefet does have a decision as well very interesting i was talking a couple of weeks ago to um aideen hopkins and marie o'neill yeah. at er i don't know whether you saw that one and then yes. Day, I was talking with Stuart McAllister in Hungary and in the Emirates basically the approach was anything expiring just hold off it's fine you can stay in the state you'll stay on your your compliance as it is now until we work out what to do and then Stuart was saying uh, no not in Hungary everything is still the biggest bureaucracy you know it, it, uh, the approach that's being taken across your um, region it's very different it's, yeah. it's very different well, um, Danielle knows a lot about this because we've had a lot of calls about expiry dates. Yeah, so with regards to France, um, 
basically, so on March 16th, that's when the country closed down and they gave a two month blanket extension for any person in the next two months who had a thing expiring a visa, a residency permit, a, short, a temporary residency permit, that it was gonna be prolonged for three months, uh, which was really reassuring. Uh, and the fact that it was blanket has reassured a lot of people. And then there's ambiguity about, okay, but if my card is expiring in June, will I be covered? And we just don't know yet. So um, there's still a lot of uncertainty amongst our clients about how the government will choose to react. And that's unfortunately the biggest um, wish that we all wish we could have right now was a crystal ball to see how the French government will react and see how this will evolve. But we just have to tell our clients, you know, we don't know. Exactly. I mean, what, what more can you do except to say, you know, obviously we'll keep you as updated as we possibly can when we know what, what the government's doing. Um, mm -hmm. very, very tricky times. I wanted to ask you um, as well, how, again, across your multi-site operation, are you seeing um, uh, governmental aid coming through to assist mm -hmm. with, your, with your teams in terms of, you know, if you have to furlough people, what's happening? So, um, in China, there is some government aid. Um, we haven't applied for any of it um, because it's quite complicated and um, we have a grant where we have a, we have a, an, a rep office. We don't even have a branch or an actual Chinese entity. So we don't believe that we would actually probably qualify for it. Um, so we haven't applied for anything there. But in China, yes, there, are, there is aid. Um, how easy it's to get, I couldn't possibly tell you, but there, there's quite, you know, there's aid, there's aid on um, the rent. Um, how long is that being maintained for? I couldn't possibly tell you. I think somebody like um, Dima Lawrence would be able to tell you. I'm, I'm hoping to talk to Dima next week. Yeah, yeah well, he, and he's, I, I might say that as a global immigration service provider, we receive a lot of information and I really would like to thank Dima and his team because they're, um, the information that we receive from them is very detailed and it's really very good. Yes. Um, lots of other people do it very well as well. Um, anyway, so that's for China. Um, for India today, there is absolutely no state aid. And um, as Danielle said, I am very transparent. So um, I will tell you in all transparency and it's very sad. Um, yes, we have um, actually had to give notice to part of our team in India. Um, they're on a notice period today, um, which is very sad, but unfortunately you have to plan ahead uh, and we couldn't possibly keep everybody uh, as the business is definitely going to be going down. I mean, we all know that. Don't, I don't think that anybody could say it's going to be the same. Uh, so that's that. In France, it's very different. Um, there is state aid here. We have what's called a uh, partial unemployment scheme, uh, which is to do with the COVID. Uh, it existed before, but this is very specific here, uh, in which you apply. It doesn't automatically mean that you will get it. You can apply for it, but you have to um, definitely be able to show why you've lost and when you started losing business. Now, we have applied for it, and normally we have it for part of the team uh, in that first start. We've seen it as of January having a China office with a large volume, we lost that in January. So we were able to show the actual, the real impact as such. So on that, it depends how much you want to apply for. You can either apply that you want to put everybody into this um, unemployment scheme, um, where they're maintained as an employee, you still continue to pay them, but you get state, or you can do it on a partial basis, which is what we've done. Um, we put everybody onto this partial system. So the team rotates during the week, some work morning, some work afternoons, etc. cetera. Um, and we will then see from how long that's going to go on. It's certainly going to be maintained until May the 11th. Uh, the government has also put in place uh, a guaranteed bank loan, which is guaranteed to the banks. Um, so most companies are applying for that. But um, I'm a Scottish last as they say so it's all fine all these state aids and loads and uh not paying your tax now and all this kind of thing but at one moment you're going to have to pay for it so <laughs> debt you have to be extremely careful and especially when it's debt with um a lower turnover yeah. so that is slightly worrying and we're certainly not we have applied but 
I hope that we won't be using it because uh, I believe that that really could be quite dangerous for companies. It, I mean, it's a couple of weeks now, and I know things have moved on, but I was talking to Rob Burns, IOR World, based in Chicago, mm -hmm. and he said the same thing, that the, at that time, what was coming from the US government was very much financial incentives from lenders for you as a company to go and borrow money. And he said, well, you know, that's all very well, but I want to come out of this without debt. I don't want to, you know, yeah, yeah very, very tricky decisions. To, to yes, I think, that, I think that for any, um, any business owners, um, or those who are running businesses, our main concern is debt. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, it is. But it's I, I just one quick question, which I, I was talking to Gordon Kerr yesterday, who oh yes, great, <laughs> great. That's just gone online today, um, and he was talking about compliance in terms of data, and obviously with your organisation, the, the the levels of data that you're handling across you know, so many different borders. Um, have you had, because he was saying in the UK, the information commissioner's office who are in charge of data protection have actually said, during this crisis, we will lower slightly the data protection. Anything like that that you're hearing? No, first of all, <laughs> uh, I mean, I certainly haven't seen anything like that come up in the EU. And anyway, I wouldn't change my level. Um, because uh, it's, like, it's like any security risk. If you lower it, um, Okay, we lower it and then we're going to go back up. It's actually easier to maintain it at the level that we have. Yeah. Yeah. So no, we're very, very strict about that. Um, and actually, in many ways, I feel that it's easier because um, people aren't printing anything. <laughs> we're all, um, right. So it's just, and, we're, and we've actually, one of the first things that we decided, which we had planned for quite some time, but one of those nice little jobs which you haven't yet finished so we've just done a major move over this weekend into a new SharePoint um, from one to another so we've got rid of a lot of old data uh, ensured that that is completely removed um, and into a very very clean system so everybody works on a SharePoint everybody we're not authorized to save anything onto our desktops that makes perfect sense I mean we've just been through this on a much much smaller scale in terms of the fact that we needed to be sure that everybody who's using our cloud-based solutions on laptops on home computers on our iMac systems that you know our IT people were in there making sure that the security because obviously you know hardwired security in an office is entirely different to a home Wi-Fi network so we just of course of course it's been a real pleasure to talk to you both. Thank you so much. I'd love to come back in a few weeks' time, find out where we are. I, I think this continuity, I, I really hope that by the next time we talk, um, you know, things will start to have been reduced in terms of restrictions. I, I read today that both Austria and Denmark are now talking about reducing their levels of restrictions. So um, in the meantime, stay well, stay positive. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Dom. An absolute pleasure as always, and you stay positive and well. Thank you and the, for the team. Lovely to Thank see you. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.